Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I got to ask Laura if she's presenting here as well. And we're going to start off with the list here that Todd has helped us compile in the chat. Thank you for that. And um, if you have any supporting documents, like you put together a PDF or you put together a PowerPoint, feel free to send that to myself or Dr. Wedding. And you could get a few potential points for that as well on top of everything. So um, again, thank you for showing up here. And we're going to get started here momentarily. And uh, Laura, do you have, uh, okay, let's see if Laura's connected. Okay, Donald, do you want to go ahead and get uh, get prepared here, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm ready. I don't have any any uh, visual okay. any visuals for you. Okay, um, so I just wanted to start off with um, a little anecdote. Um, so I I looked into the quote unquote urban legend of Target predicting the teenage girl's pregnancy, and sort of the more the more I the more I dug into that, the more I found out that. No, one, sort of the, the genesis of that was a New York Times article based on a speech given by a target rep named Andrew Pohl at the Predictive World Analytics World Conference back in 2014, I believe it was. I'm missing it in my notes. But what the base of the talk was about target's goal to be able to predict if someone was pregnant or not and to be able to basically to be able to get, get their market demand for all, all the products, i.e. just basically get to the money before, before someone else can. And so what I found out was that based on that talk, that the chairman of the, of the conference had a conversation with the author of, of the article from the New York Times, just talking about how Target wanted to, you know, had this goal of making these types of predictions. And that's how it, it snowballed into all of a sudden this anecdote coming out of, you know, coming out of the blue of the father going into the Target store and, you know, you know, demanded to speak to the manager about why, you know, why he's, why they're sending his daughter, you know, pregnancy material, you know, basically, well, ads at, you know, marketing, you know, tailored for pregnant women. And apparently he came back, he called back and said, oh, I guess my daughter is pregnant. So what I found out was that that's basically how, how the story came along. But really what the interesting part about that to me was that not as much as the fact that they wanted to, the target wanted to predict the pregnancy, but that they want to predict a predictor of, of market behavior, of, of consumer behavior, which, which I thought was a very interesting art in itself, because if you can anticipate that, that's, an, that's another way that you can be, you know, you know, capitalize on on demand. So, so the question I had, you know, based on that was, you know, a little bit twofold. Of one, if they could even do that, you know, how would they know that they're actually, you know, you know, whatever their modeling was was actually accurate, or was, you know, would it just be a case of, you know, the law of large numbers, you know, just throw throw a bunch of darts at the wall and see see what sticks. Or, or broken clock just being right twice a day. Then so what I found, so what I started to look into was, all right, you know, let's let's talk about like coming down to an algorithm. How can you measure the accuracy of an algorithm? And so what I what I saw was that, you know, one, there's a couple of questions. You know, are we talking about the accuracy of of the algorithm of you know how many times how many times is the prediction correct based on the number of tries? You know, how precise is, is the algorithm, which is a whole whole other topic of, you know, you know, let's say in the pregnancy example, you know, of the pregnant woman that they found, you know, how many, how many were actually pregnant of what they predicted? And then there, and then there's, you know, other areas such as, you know, such as recall. So, so the, so the question was, you know, how do you know, you know, how, you know, how do you actually evaluate the algorithm that sort of like do like quality checks? And what I found was, you know, there's sort of two paths you can take. You know, there's one where you can take take data that you already know sort of like the, the solution or the end game to and really, you know, test your algorithm against that. 
to see how it performs. And then two, there is the concept of resampling, which is really saying that if you have a population, you just take random samples out of that population and see, see how your algorithm works based on based on using those samples rather than the whole population and, and measuring across that. So with that, there are, you know, there are there are its own own sort of methods of, of doing that resampling, you know, which you know, which you look up to. So the names are you know, train and test sets, uh, K fold cross validation, you know, leave one out cross validation, and repeated random test train splits. So so that, that was basically all I had for Okay. No, thank you for sharing that, Donald. Was your did I miss it earlier? Was this about the Target study by chance that Target did? Yes. Okay, yeah. I went ahead and I found an article to share with the group here because I thought I heard you say that. And um, I shared it within the group there to everybody. And it's something I heard about a few years ago as well. It's really interesting. Um, focuses on just the importance of statistics. And honestly, it was something that happened way back at, way back when. And I'm sure you've seen, you know, this get replicated in different other, you know, retail companies. Um, Amazon's a little bit more sophisticated with some of their stuff uh, than what this is. But it's definitely interesting. And um, I think you really brought a, a very good, you know, article to the group here to read. So if anybody's interested in reading more about that or Donald, if you had a better article citing it or something, feel free to share that as well. But um, I went ahead and just shared it there in the chat as you were talking because I it kind of you know triggered something for me. So thank you for uh, sharing upon that. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to, to Donald. Yeah, absolutely. And I will uh, I'll forward you the article. I'll see if see if we may, may even be talking about the same one as well. Good deal. Okay, thank you, Donald. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move. Uh, anybody have any questions for Donald here by chance? Uh, okay, no, good, straightforward here, awesome. Um, Emily, are you uh, prepared to go ahead and go next? Yep, I am. Um, let me just pull up my material. Um, also was wondering, could you drop your email in the chat so that we can forward you that material later? Yep, 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 yep. I'll go ahead and drop my, my email in there. And, um, Yep, I'll go ahead and drop that in there. We'll do, Emily. Okay, thanks. And I'm not pulling up my stuff now. Um, can you see like a blue slide on the screen? Yep, we can see your screen there. Okay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm my name is Emily Castaneras, and I'm in uh, Don Wedding's uh, 498 course, capstone course. Um, today, I'm just going to give a brief overview of a system called DALE, um, which is a system created by OpenAI. So these are snippets taken directly from the OpenAI website to explain who they are. So OpenAI is governed by a uh, board uh, by the board of the OpenAI nonprofit which is comprised of these list of employees, but some of these board members that I think are interesting and kind of telling of uh, OpenAI's interests um, are that both Reid Hoffman and Adam D'Angelo are on the board, um, who are the CEOs of uh, Quora and prior former uh, LinkedIn co-founder. So um, there's a lot of uh, tech interest in, in this OpenAI um, company. And they also are described as the first of its kind API that can be applied to any language task and serves millions of production requests each day. OpenAI's mission is to ensure that artificial and general intelligence, by which they mean highly autonomous systems, can outperform humans at most economically viable benefit that it benefits all of humanity. So then moving on to what is this DALE system that they've uh, created. So, First, the name is actually named after the artist Salvador Dali and uh, the Pixar's Wale movie. So it's a combination of those two um, real and fictional people, characters. Um, so Dali, as a system though, it creates image from, images from text captions for a wide range of applications um, expressible in natural language. Um, Dali, uh, from a technical standpoint, is a 12 billion parameter decoder only transformer neural network trained to generate images from text descriptions and is trained on a data set of text image pairs. 
Um, it receives both the text and the image as a single stream of data containing up to 1,280 tokens. Um, but that doesn't really give you a good uh, indication of what it is. So in just a minute, I'm actually going to pull up some examples um, that I found on it, a OpenAI's blog, blog post about DALE. Um, but before I switch over to that, I just wanted to summarize some of its abilities and limitations so that as we're walking through these examples, um, you can kind of think back to, to what's listed here. So in terms of abilities, DALE is, uh, also has the ability to combine disparate ideas to synthesize objects some of which are unlikely to exist in the real world. So you'll see that in a minute. Also repeating the caption or repeating the text with alternate phrasing improves the consistency of the results or improves the accuracy of the results. Um, but on the other end of things, um, there's some limitations that you'll also observe with the uh, simulations that DALE produces. So for one, as more objects are introduced into a scene, DALE is liable to confuse those associations between objects, specifically an object and its adjective, perhaps orange and purple uh, will be swapped and, and you'll see that, um, and their specific attributes. Um, it, also, it also often fails to draw one or more of the specified objects that are described in the text. And finally, DALE also seems to occasionally confuse less common colors with other neighboring shades. So let's see it in action. All right, I've switched screens. Let me know if that didn't go through, but I think, I think it did. All right, so hopefully you can all see images of raspberries here. Um, so the first one that I wanted to uh, show you is, so here's a text prompt that Dolly receives as an input. Um, and these are just drop downs for the sake of example, but um, in real application, you, you would just top to type this out yourself. Um, but you can see here, I can change it to, um, cube, and then I can choose something such as, um, let's go with uh, watermelon and see how accurate the results are. So again, these are not um, pre-stored images. They're actually generated based off of the text prompt. Um, so DALI system is it produces these uh, examples. And in many cases, they, they did a really great job of representing a cube made of watermelon. But you'll also notice times where it didn't get it perfect. So here on the bottom left, second to the left, um, that's not really a perfect cube. And um, that would be considered not a very accurate uh, example. So let's go down. I have a, a few more examples. Um, there's also so many really interesting examples on this blog. So I, I will drop the, the website here if anybody is interested in checking out more examples and, and learning about this further. Um, but the next example, that I have is right here. Um, so in this case, I'm going to switch to um, instead of a T-shirt, let's go with a uh, I guess a soda can, and uh, let's make it blue. And I want the image to be of a pineapple. So I'd say that it wasn't very good at uh, creating images that describe that because a lot of these do not have. Um, Actually, I take that back. Well, it depends how you interpret this. To me, the pineapple should have been yellow in like every instance to be correct. But the image of the pineapple is there, which is, is really cool. Um, and the can is mostly blue in every time except for down here. So all in all, you know, pretty good. Um, two more examples. So here is an example of this application when it comes to uh, potential uses for like the fashion industry, especially like e-commerce. So here it can, uh, it can create images that you define for a mannequin. And I'm going to change this to, um, let's say a black, uh, black cardigan sweater and a pink skirt. So it should be black and pink. So in many instances, it got it right. I'd say this is a pretty good, um, this is a pretty good output. Um, this one here is not really pink, so I'd say that would be an error. But it's really cool because you can easily start to conceive different applications for this system. And um, I'm just really impressed by the ease of, uh, from, from the user standpoint. I have only one example left, and that's actually um, in the context of an illustration. So the DALE is also capable of uh, creating images that are, a, that are illustrations, which can extend to applications for books and comics and um, so many ideas out there um, in the publishing space. 
Um, but here, let's change the animal to a baby fox and let's put him uh, in a suit and let's have him, um, let's have him using a calculator because he's a businessy fox. Um, so yeah, there is, like, I did say that there are limitations as you introduce more objects, what an object might be missing, for example, but in this case, it seems like the calculator is present, the fox is present, and he's wearing a suit in most of the cases. I'm so, trying to figure out there what's happening with that middle image. This one, or no, no, down here. <laughs> yeah, it's a great point. So sometimes it's uh, jumbled and, and that would be not a success. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm gonna have nightmares tonight thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so hopping back over here, um, those were the examples I wanted to show you just for time's sake, not going to go into to any more, but I will drop the link if you're curious about more. And that pretty much concludes my um, presentation on this topic. Um, ho hopefully you found it interesting. Very interesting, Emily. Thank you for sharing that there with us. Um, does anybody have any questions for Emily here? What, um, what made you interested in looking into this? How did you discover this? Yeah, um, so I discovered it because I get, I'm subscribed to a couple of uh, data science um, newsletters that just come in my inbox. And one of them is I think just Data Science Weekly. Um, and so I always kind of just look at the snippets of the titles in that. And I knew that this presentation was coming up. So I was like, oh, I wonder if anything's really interesting to me. And I found this um, this blog post from, from that source actually. And the reason I was interested in it specifically was um, the NLP stuff really fascinates me. Um, I'm really excited to see how it extends into real world, real world applications. Um, and this was really in line with that interest. Cool. Hey, thank you, Emily. I appreciate you sharing that. If you don't mind uh, shooting over your presentation, if you want to, to me and Dr. Wedding. Um, We'll go ahead and make sure to give you a few extra points for that as well. So thank you for sharing. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on here to our next uh, person. Uh, Todd, looking forward to what you have here, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And uh, first off, it's great to, to spend some time with everybody tonight. Um, you know, something that I was thinking about, let me turn on my camera here so you guys can see me. Um, first off, uh, in the 498 class, looking forward to being done very soon. And uh, just something that we do at, at, at you know, some a program that I lead at work, which is uh, I lead a team. I have a team of about um, 25 data scientists. Uh, and um, something that I always am looking to do with them is to find ways to reduce risk and, and kind of work inside, and rather than just teach them new skills and things like that. Like how do we deal with the business realities of um, uncertainty, right? So we, you know, most of the problems we get are, aren't very clean. And so, um, Anyway, um, we have this program that we put together. I kind of had to strip it. There's there's a lot of layers to it, but we essentially call it the uh, you know fearless data science, right? And so uh, kind of like you know as uh, as uh, Professor Wedding said at the beginning of the class, you know he had that you know fear, uncertainty, doubt link that he had shared, or you know sorry, rather uh, words of wisdom, you know. And I think that this is you know when I look through this program, you know having gone through the program for a while, and I'll be honest, I've been with I've been in the program a little longer than most. Uh, I joined back in uh, 2017 and just basically kind of strung it along as much as uh, as much as work would pay for and other and other types of considerations. But, you know, I think that for a lot of us, we have this fear of of, you know, of these fears on the left hand side, you know, being wrong, looking dumb, the unknown. And I think that, you know, um, as practitioners, we often have a feeling that uh, we have to be like absolutely right on these things right like like quantitatively we have to be bulletproof and we take a lot of uh, pressure on ourselves uh, when it comes to, to working through the projects but the reality is that's that's not the case so whenever we have particularly you know, new phds that are coming out of school and they're kind of coming out of this kind of contained environment you know we essentially introduce this this framework to uh to help them through their, their process of basically reducing fear um and so you know, this is this is kind of just like said, the, the opener of our program, but essentially when we talk about like how to kind of in practice fearless data science, right? Um, a lot of it is first off is it's not just about knowing the best technology, but it's also about, you know, understanding the human beings that you're working with on the other side of the equation. You know, um, I was thinking about during our capstone project, right? We've, we've had our first model we've run through. We're starting to hit the realities of this data set that we're getting into. And uh, in a business space where you have active business users who are kind of engaged in your project, 
you know, a lot of things that data scientists don't do is that as soon as they get a problem, they immediately step right into the technology, right? They step right into modeling. That's where they want to be. But, um, you know, what's so important and something that I find is a failing of even some of the experienced data scientists I've worked with is that they don't time to take time to like validate assumptions on the problem space. Um, this is, you know, the, I know that we kind of use that term, you know, a bingo bonus points sometimes in 498. Um, this is, these are, these are bingo bonus points in life, right? Yeah, whenever you're working with your business partner and you're looking to get that investment or you're looking to get that feedback, you know, uh, it's very common sense thing to say validate assumptions, but I'll say that, especially for the more technical technology oriented folks, the first thing to do is they jump right into the modeling and they don't even take some time to spend with a customer giving them homework to find out what their assumptions are. So that's a, that's a huge thing. Um, another kind of common sense piece, but is get past the surface into the unknown. And this is whereby once you've framed up the problem that they've worked with you, you know, they framed up the problem, they've given it to you. Um, you know, if the problem was easy to solve, it's something I tell my team all the time, if it was easy to solve, we would, it wouldn't be in front of us, right? And so uh, again, this is where, you know, you need to embrace your natural curiosity and not try to just be the expert, the domain expert. Like if you come in and you say, oh, I'm the expert on XYZ and like, you know, you want to go and, and you're supposed to be really smart, you know, but it's, it also kind of boxes you into corners sometimes that you actually don't take the time to like uh, to get kind of gritty and get past the surface details and give yourself the chance to ask good questions. Um, I can remember real recently a project we had come through where um, they asked us to validate a particular type of, uh, of a vendor, right? They said, here are all our vendors and they sell widgets, right? And, you know, we said, and they said, we want to help, you know, figure out which vendors to select for our widgets. But the, you know, the gritty part of it was actually going in and saying, okay, what's a widget? Like, how do you guys define what that widget is? And then going back to the, the data itself and say, can we actually prove that Bob's tire company really sells tires and things like that? And, and that's where, you know, you start building up some of that domain expertise around the problem statement that has nothing to do with technology, um, but it, it kind of gives you a sense, of, it starts giving you a sense of credibility. And then the other piece is, um, you know, just to have a transparent process ask lots of questions and make sure you, you over commu overly communicate to your business users along the way. Um, you know, if you don't explain the linkage to your results, like if you came to me today and you asked me about a data science project, I'm going to say, okay, I hear what you're saying. Here's your problem statement. And here's how we're going to approach it in terms of, I'm going to ask you for these different parts of your data. And then when things come back, right. If I, in the case of uh, Bob's tires, for example, uh, when things come back, I would say, I said, okay, you asked us to go find the best tire sales place, right? And we went out and we said, what is a tire? And then we went and we found all the places that sell tires. And then this is where you start explaining the approach. We looked at a percentage of total sales for those companies, for example, that sell tires. And our recommendation is that we should skip Bob's tires because we feel like they don't sell tires. That's tires aren't their business. It just happens to be what we think that they do. And again, this happens all the time where uh, you're losing some of that translation. And you should just spend a lot of time asking good questions, making sure, again, you're validating the assumptions, which informs your approach, which ultimately turns into results. And then underneath, you know, if key decisions change, the answer will change, that is okay. Um, something that Professor Wedding says in our 498 class, or at least if I recall, is that, um, you know, is a focus on value proposition. He always talks about you know, not about trying to solve world hunger with these modeling projects, but, so, but focus in on the value proposition. And so um, this is, again, that key decisions change, the answer will change. This is exactly that. You know, uh, once we tell them Bob's tires don't sell, doesn't sell tires, we might find out that there's something about Bob's tires where we need to include them in, in as part of the approach. And that's okay. Like, give yourself some forgiveness not to be solving for a perfect, for world hunger, you know, or, or some sort of silver bullet. So uh, anyway, and then again, this is just a framework. You know, the other thing is this is an AI use case recipe. If you do nothing else, if you remember nothing else with this presentation, you know, you should screenshot this right now. This is the way for you to build up. It isn't about always executing on technology. This is a way for you to give some homework to your customer, whoever is asking you to do the model to help kind of build some exchange that ultimately helps you be more successful. 
Um, you can see there, you know, just your customer has to understand their data. They have to have responsibility to understand that we need to understand the history of whatever it is we're looking at for these models to be smarter. Um, you know, the second one, begin with the end in mind. Um, this is where you say, if I told you exactly what you wanted to know, uh, how would you use it, right? A lot of times they can't answer that. Um, they don't know how uh, a model result would actually inf influence their process, or they might not be open to it. So you need to ask those questions up. Like, I mean, but like, if you asked me about like finding the best tires, I would come, I would, the first things I would do is ask, I'd ask you, like, you know, what are you going to do if I, if I give you the perfect re report or data output? Um, quantifiable error number three, uh, this is again, you know, just, this is like saying, how good of improvement right so if, uh, sometimes they'll say hey we're really interested in this thing but they don't really have it well defined um, quantifiable error is a way to help you understand how much of a pie there is that you're tackling so when you give them a model and you say we're doing 10 percent improvement over your process um, sometimes that number three is what lets you know okay 10 percent is this much of perfect and uh, you want to make sure that they understand their process enough to know what the opportunity that they're missing out on. And that helps you, again, testify to the, the value of the model where you could say, hey, you missed 100 sales last week, but because of modeling, we were able to recoup you know, this many of them or we were able to convert this many leads. And uh, it gives you a basis, again, on, on a value proposition. Uh, value of the improvement, this is just comes down to what's a 1% improvement. You know, if I, if I convert that extra lead, What's the percentage of proven on that process? Again, these are all, if they can't answer these questions, they owe it to you as data scientists and as analytic practitioners, they owe it to you to give it back to you because otherwise you're gonna end up with a model and at the end, you know, you're know, you gonna say, hey, we did this great work and they're gonna be like, oh, that's great. We don't really know what it's worth. This is, this, these, this, this is what's how you get to that. And then lastly, you know, does my problem have the ability to scale? Um, you know, I was on a call with a CIO uh, who's doing some mentoring for me at work, which is a nice benefit. And it's, uh, he's from a big, uh, from like old school, you know, old school industrial 1980s uh, kind of company that was, uh, you know, top of the stock market. And, um, and he, uh, he was telling me, he's like, how do you go from good to wow, right? That number five there is how you do that, right? This is how you get to wow. The idea is that you take this one little nugget of an idea you turn it, you, you say, can I apply this other places? Um, an example that we have that I worked on recently is they were asking us to validate some addresses, right? So they said, oh, go look for addresses and just make sure the addresses are right, which involves a little bit of NLP and some other stuff to figure out if one address is the other address if you need to fix it. But because we got so smart on addresses, we were able to scale that into drive time distances and then ultimately into uh, actually recommending when, where the company should actually build buildings, purchase you know, purchase land, build buildings, because we took a little problem and we were very creative. We took a little problem on just solving for addresses and we built scale to it to say, oh, well, if you say, oh, I'll give you your right address. What are you trying to do? And they say, oh, we're trying to find where our customers are centered. We say, oh, we can do that. We can do drive times between where the customers are at in our facilities and start creating some intelligence on that. And then they said, okay. And then the next thing is, well, we really want to expand in this new area. We don't know anything about it. And then we say, okay, we validate that we have this data. We validate, you know, this address data. We've built in a way to determine those drive times. And all of a sudden now we start doing some centroid locations to say, well, we could drop a building right here. If you can buy a building at 4th and, and fourth and Main, then you're within this amount of in, uh, influence on those customers. So all just uh, really great questions. And like your customers, your boss, whoever, they, they, they owe this to you to help you set up for success. And lastly, cause I know I'm probably running a little long, but this is like a week program that I kind of try to strip down into five minutes, you know, communicate regularly, be very transparent, always, always send communication to your bosses, to your customers, um, you know, manage expectations, uh, as it says, or they'll be managed for you. Uh, it's important to set up goals and help them to understand, you know, the progress you're making so that they're not asking for you to shoot to the moon whenever it has to kind of mature along through a process. Uh, the other thing, data scientists are not finance people. Uh, check your math. The people you're going to be working with usually are operators or other cases. They're, they're way more driven by reconciliation of finances and other types of performance measures. And uh, you need to check your counts and amounts. You know, I remember 
recently uh, somebody was doing a, a state ranking of states for something. And they had 52 states on there, right? And I was like, well, why are there 52 states on there? They're like, well, the model's great. And I said, the model's junk because there's 52 states on there. I can look on this PowerPoint and in 10 seconds, they've lost all credibility. Um, use the validation of those assumptions to, uh, to make sure that you are baselining in what their reality is and you understand their point of view. Because if you don't start there, it doesn't matter how accurate your model is, it'll, it'll, you'll get shot down and you'll never get to slide two. So uh, with that, uh, you know, appreciate you guys listening to that. I think I probably ran over a little bit, Logan, but uh, naturally open up to any questions. I mean, we use this program. You know, I mean, I took, I've taken, I don't know, 150 data scientists through this program, a version of this program. So, uh, you know, if you guys have any thoughts, uh, yeah, let me know. No, thank you for sharing that, Todd. Um, I think you really did a good job of connecting it to the real world there kind of make those connections like Dr. Wedding does. So I think a lot of folks here are able to find value in that, I'm sure. And if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to, uh, I'm sure, Todd here at any time. So, okay, thanks again, Todd. Um, we'll go ahead and move on here to Mark. Uh, Mark, are you ready to go here, sir? Hey, yeah. I'm just going to, I got a deck here that I'm going to whip through pretty quickly. Uh, I just need to find it, but I'm not. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, I guess. Uh, see if that works. Uh, here we go. Yep, we can see your screen there. There we go. Can you see the slides? Yep, you're good, Mark. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, this is this is a pretty big topic, so I guess I'd encourage anyone who's interested to reach out, and I'd, I'd actually be happy to share my uh, slides as well. Um, but a lot of folks in this program are either going to, and not everybody, of course, there's a lot of enter enterprise established companies that are doing data science, but data science um, is in a lot of startups these days. And in fact, my day job is investing in directly and indirectly through other funds uh, in the energy world. And more and more, I'm seeing data science as part of uh, almost table stakes for technology companies in the energy space. So you can imagine that's probably pretty true in a lot of industries. So for those that are going into startups and or going to be a founder or a co-founder of your own startup, I thought I'd just share a little bit about uh, the world of funding, uh, venture funding, and there's other, other types of funding out there. And I'll whip through this pretty quick. Um, those that are uh, going after funding are always always uh, involved in some kind of a pitch. It can be formal or informal, but almost like in our capstone where we're pitching the CEO on a data science project, you might be pitching your company to an investor and a lot of the same things are ring true. It's, uh, it's less about the solution. It's more about what are you doing to make my life easier? Uh, what is the value proposition? And so that's really important. And this slide just talks about some of the pitch deck must haves. Uh, it, it, uh, I won't go into this if somebody's interested in or is going to do a pitch or is involved in a, in a startup that is working on their pitch deck. I'd be, I'd love to give you some opinions on uh, the approach here. But the, the common theme here is it's more about the problem statement and how you're going to make that problem either go away or improve the outcome. Uh, even if the problem still exists, what, how are you going to make that person or that stakeholder or that CEO or that investor uh, and, their, and their customer space, how are you going to improve with your solution? That's, that's what the value proposition is all about. It's the, the, the solution's interesting and it's part of due diligence, but it's not what you talk about in a pitch up front. I think it, it's part of it, but it's just not a lot of people jump into the solution or the technology. And if you're not solving something with, with that investor is going to fall asleep if, if he doesn't understand what the problem statement is. So similar to, again, pitching to your CEO on, a, on an analytics project. Um, team is important. Why the team doesn't have to be experienced. There's a misnomer that, you know, you have to have been a, a startup founder and successful and had an exit to be a founder. Well, somebody has to start somewhere. So it's more about what your team's story is and why they're passionate about it and why they're going to communicate to the investor that they are going to execute 
it's uh, it's it's key that you know the passion and the desire comes through in the pitch. Uh, and then this is you know this is probably its own its own topic itself, but you're either selling um, to an investor an equity position, shares in your company, or you're 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 asking for a loan. And it's really you know two models, and you can get both in the same uh, deal structure. Sometimes it's a little more rare, but uh, the there's different types of equity on the share side. It's going to be venture capital. Venture capital is going to be spending other people's money, not their own, typically. Uh, they're working on behalf of, of other investors that are called limited partners. Corporate venture capital, that's what I do. So I'm spending money of my corporation. Uh, it's, it's our way of doing R&D by investing in startups that we couldn't all, uh, otherwise participate in in that space because we don't have the time or the resources so we'll invest in a company that's strategic and and we you know the outcome may not win but we're going to learn through that as to what our business looks like in the future uh, so corporate venture capital can be an important uh if because they can become a customer of yours if you raise money through them as well so it's not just about financial investment private equity is a little different than venture in that it's it's just a later stage and typically a bigger ownership position than venture. Uh, angel investors kind of at the earlier stage, close to friends and family where they're typically investing their own money and at earlier stages. Uh, and of course the earliest stage is your own money and your friends and family when you're first starting up. Uh, debt, I won't spend a lot of time on, but you have to pay the debt back versus equity. You don't, you don't have to pay that back. The, the the beauty of debt is if you can pay it back, you're not giving up ownership in the long run. Uh, and the beauty of equity is it it doesn't uh, it doesn't accrue interest typically. Debt's a big topic as well. And of course, you know, in the modern world, there's lots of other funding opportunities now. You've probably heard of crowdfunding, where people that are going to be customers of your future products or services are going to pay you up front in the hopes of being kind of early customers. And that's that's actually worked pretty well in some business models. Um, cryptocurrency, you know, lots of lots of, lots going on there. I think the initial coin offerings have, have faded a bit um, and stabilized with the ones that are out there. I'm sure there's going to be more to come. Of course, grants where you either have to pay them back or you don't. Um, you know, they're just based on a success criteria. You keep that money, and it's non-dilutive. You don't give up ownership, and you don't have to pay interest. Bootstrapping is always an option. That just means you're not taking in outside money. It's just your own money or friends and family money. Venture stage is kind of where I'll finish up today. Uh, this kind of ties to the type of venture capital on the equity side that you might raise. And this little diagram kind of talks about uh, seed and angel level. And then you get to early stage VC, uh, you know, and then you start talking about series a through d through f through g i mean it can go on forever and then eventually you're going to get into either an ipo or a private equity or even a, a, a private sale uh and then there's the more recent phenomenon of going public through a spac uh which is which is uh, starting to slow down a little bit as well but this is a good kind of graph for people that don't understand what, what's the difference between a venture round d versus pre-seed or a series seed or an ipo uh, and then, the, I, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this one, but the capitalization of that equity and how it comes in and how the company gets priced. If you watch uh, Shark Tank at all, you kind of get a sense of that. They're giving up a certain percentage of the company, and that sets the valuation depending on how much money you're raising. Uh, and then there's concepts like pre-money and post-money and fully dilution. Those are things that you're going to have to understand, warrants and options, which are uh, future access to stock, and those can be discounted. Term sheets are really everything in a deal, and there's a whole um, uh, language and, and understanding around that. Uh, and uh, I have a very, at the end here, I have an example of a cap table uh, before and after uh, a Series A as an example, and I'd be happy to walk people through this if they're interested. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Okie doke. 
Um, hey, uh, hey uh, Logan, can I ask Mark a question? Because it's yeah, a, ahead, a, a, re, a really unique domain expertise. Mark, I think that uh, what if, if we get asked to join a startup, we're on the other side of the coin, right? And I, so okay. I have a, a friend of mine, he's leaving to join a startup and he said, oh, they're past their series A. And he felt like that de-risked moving to that company, right? Um, you know, I think that a lot of people here, I mean, I'm just saying generalization, but I think that we're going to be on the, the innovation front, right? I don't, I, we'll, we'll get our money eventually, but I wonder if what kind of, how would you like do a sniff test if you're going into an interview for a startup, like what would you want to see before you'd be comfortable, you know, jumping on there? Like what, what, what was, what's your sniff test for that? Yeah, I think it's going to be up to the individual and their risk uh, tolerance, you know, and their stage of their career. Um, and, and I think every company is going to be different as well. And so, I, you know, it's, a, that's a, it depends is the answer, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think, I think you want to understand certainly cash flow and understand when they're going to run out of cash based on the current burn. And, you know, they should be able, if, if you're going to come in and you're going to have access to options as part of your comp package, uh, which is common for a venture back company. You know, you're going to participate maybe in less salary in the anticipation of a bigger win down the work road as you as you put in your effort sweat equity um you're going to want to understand what the next fundraise looks like and how much cash uh is available to that next fundraise that's that's number one and in fact an investor who's going coming in the next round is going to look at that same thing and say okay if i invest this amount this is based on your burn rate on what you're telling me you need to hire and the technology you're buying or the capital you're spending you know this is going to get us first this is this fundraise or the money we've already raised in the case of a new employee is going to get us six more months of burn you know based on your sales projections of course if your sales are uh, turn out to be a little bit wrong which they always are then that's three more months right and so kind of understanding when the company, you know, needs to be out raising that next round or when they need to break even from a profit standpoint so they don't have to raise money again, which is always good. That's your goal. You know, just understanding that I think at any stage is, is critical because if your CEO isn't out raising money in that third month, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And so that's kind of under if your CEO can can explain that to you quickly you know they appreciate it and they're watching it because the CEO, a good CEO and a venture back company is always raising money. They're always in fundraise mode. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, that did. I appreciate that. And then another question, and, and Logan, I, this is just, again, I think we all have a unique chance. Mark doesn't want to hear from me in his private life later when I harass him. Um, what would you recommend in terms of like, so I've been asked to do like pro bono advising for some of these startups, right? And and, um, and like, I'll say that I've never asked for compensation. I do a lot of mentoring and- Yeah, um, good, one of good them, for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And one of them, uh, some of them started to see some real like success, not in the terms that they're done, they're not done raising money. And these are more, uh, the biggest one I think now, they just opened a second office in Chicago. And uh, it was just a, uh, I just, you know, happen to be lucky that I understand a lot of the technology stuff. And I, I'm usually the young guy in the room with all the silverbacks of like that are the rich, you know, experienced folks. What's uh, what sort of compensation or whatever, like, what would you just, if, you know, what sort of expectation I have, you know, again, just broadly, yeah. no risk, but like, what should I, what's, what's my secret sauce? What's my word I should ask for? Cause I get, yeah. I, I, I get asked to do this a lot. So. And, and, and you're not on the board of directors in this case, you're just an advisor from a right. technology exactly. or, a, or mentor standpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so the, the beauty of venture capital in this, in this world is there's really not a lot of rules. And so that actually makes it harder because there's a lot of jargon there's a lot of, you know, there's a West coast uh, flavor and there's an East coast flavor, at least in the U S. And so there's a little bit of, you know, tribal knowledge that you have to get through, but in your case, you know, you can always ask for whatever compensation you think is fair. I mean, so the sky is the limit. I think what I see in practice is, you know, uh, advisors can get warrants, which are, uh, if you're, if you're, you know, or options, typically options are a term that you use for employees. So if you're an advisor or an LLC or a C corp that's advising a, a startup, um, you know, you could get warrants are the same. It's just a different term for the same thing. You would get warrants um, that have a strike price that are fa fairly discounted so that if there's any success or an exit down the road, you can participate in some way. And there's really not a lot of downside other than a little bit of uh, giving up a little bit of equity 
Uh, and so board members that are independent will typically get offered warrants to be on the board if they're critical for that company's success. Uh, so yeah, you, you know, it's, it's, it's all about what the company wants to do to retain your services. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And Todd, thank you for adding to the discussion there and adding some, uh, definite some talking points for us here um, that might give some people here some ideas here down the road on something they want to look into further. So thank you for that. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and move on here to Chris. Um, Chris, if you're ready to present, we can go ahead and move on to you, sir. Yeah, let me just get my PowerPoint. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so I want to talk to everyone today about something that uh, I've learned in the last 14 years that I've been uh, working at a very large enterprise, right? And uh, given this is, you know, all of us have gone through three years, two years, one year, whatever we're taking in this program. Um, it's really cool we get to create models. It's really cool that we get to uh, solve automation problems. But often what I think we miss out on uh, is, is the data integrity, the data quality, and just the scale that you have to deal with um, at a very large enterprise. Uh, to give some background about what I do, current, well, I'm currently employed at JP Morgan. I'm actually switching jobs into Citibank. So those large banks are uh, lots of data, lots of volume, lots of challenges, lots of, I like to call it mini uh, organizations uh, within the company and that all is, is just a puddle mud is the best way to kind of put it. Um, so what I wanted to share is just what is reality and some of the war stories that, um, that, uh, that I've come across in the last 14 years. And then some of the, talk about some of the things I wish I had and you know, an overview of what that may have looked like. So the first thing I would start out with is what is data integrity, what's data quality, and then what's large scale aggregation, right? I don't think a lot of people have spent a lot of time uh, fine tuning these challenges, right? And I hope the next couple of examples articulate what that is. Uh, so it's hard, right? And I'm learning this right now in my capstone, I'm going through um, our project is focused on uh, cough recordings of people that are that have been diagnosed with COVID that are healthy or symptomatic. And we're trying to predict the COVID uh, dry cough uh, to see if we can maybe help out the testing situation. Uh, but with anything in data is you got uh, data that's missing uh, some useful information like you have a cough with a fever, you have a cough with a chill, you have a cough with a respiratory illness. Uh, some coughs are uh, have background noise, some coughs are just like music playing. Right, so you deal with a lot of this, no matter if it's something that we're doing in this program, um, something that we're trying to do in the capstone, uh, but some real life examples is uh, on a data integrity perspective is one of the things I did in my prior role um, is uh, we went through what we call access uplift and access uplift essentially is what type of access and what is privileged that, what is privileged or who has those privileged access in the bank. Um, to talk about scale is we had over 50,000 databases in JP Morgan. And even though I was able to aggregate all of the users, all of the entitlements, all the roles and the access that people had to 50,000 databases, it was still incomplete or, uh, and could not be relied on 100% uh, of the time because there was always a bespoke database out there. Maybe that someone gave an incorrect connection string, the connection strings weren't well maintained. Uh, so because of that, you go deal with the SEC or the feds, they ask you how you're controlling that data integrity. Um, in terms of data quality, uh, I think I gave a pretty good example here. In my current role, I deal with telemetry data, observability, uh, system health. Um, and when you're trying to correlate different types of systems, one person is publishing data as memory utilized, another person is publishing it as memory utilized. Now, this is a very simple example. But when you're talking about, um, you know, maybe a couple hundred different uh, potential features, if those just the column name is not something that is useful, human readable, it could really hurt your data quality um, and your integrity as well. Um, and just talking about the scale, right? So in my in my last role that I'm moving out of, 
is uh, one of the things that I was responsible for is I was responsible to make sure that we could move 350 terabytes of logs ingested a day. Um, a lot of challenges come with that. What does that cost? Because so, you, you don't want to just put that on high expensive storage. You're talking probably a couple, like $50 million just to store these logs. Um, do we actually need it all? Uh, you know, if logs are coming in uh, every second, do you need to store the log every second or can you deduplicate that and say, I store this log entry, you know, 80 times in the last hour as an example. And just going back on the storage costs, they sent it as XML. Uh, XML, if you have never dealt with it, it's a very expensive way to store data. Um, and in those situations, you kind of want to catch that data uh, upstream so that you can transform that or transpose that into being more like JSON or, or a better uh, uh, data format. So those are just some of my examples of some war stories that I've experienced um, um, in my 14 years. So what do I wish I had? Uh, you know, moving into my next role, this is a largely what I'm going to be focused on is you got to have data architecture talking about um, how you land, how you store, how you transport, um, and also how you model and um, uh, uh, name your attributes, right? Is that's all data architecture, right? Is you don't build a house without creating an architecture of it. You don't put a roof on a house without the foundation on it. And architecture is largely the foundation of what drives successful data implementations. Um, you want data management. You want people in the right data roles. I'll touch on data management in a second. Um, you want to be able to make sure you're following the right regulatory and compliance. You want to make sure you're plugged into your cybersecurity organization. And you want to make sure that the way you're doing that is encrypted and done correctly. Um, so what, what are some lessons that I can uh, give this audience here, right? Is it would have been really nice if I had a data book um, going back to that example I gave where I, you can have a couple of hundred different um, um, uh, column names um, and just mem utilize versus memory utilize, while simple, can actually cause a lot of headaches down the line, is a data book really catalogs that data um, and provides controls around what the metadata, who owns that data. So going back to the data integrity, in an example of when I had a bad connection string, it would have been really nice to know who I need to hold accountable to go fix that connection string so we can get into that database, right? So a data book really helps you understand what data your company has, um, what, uh, who owns it, what does it mean, what attributes does it come into? Think of it as like a Rolodex of the data that's in your bank uh, in your, that you're working with. Um, you want to make sure you have data lineage. So you got to be able to trace that data back to uh, the system of record that generated it. Um, because it's it, as we all go through this program, we create a lot of uh, features um, that we're creating ourselves when we, when we do exploratory data analysis, when we do a Tableau dashboard. Um, but if you don't know where that system originated, for all you know, you could be taking that, that modified data that I created uh, without understanding what the birth of that data really was. You want to be able to have data lineage back to the birth of that data. Um, in terms of data quality, uh, I talk a bit about, you know, sense of ownership, understanding um, what rules that uh, accompany that data and so on. Um, more in the regulatory space is uh, you want to make sure you have classification, uh, um, uh, classification, uh, attributes like, does this data contain personal information? If any of you guys work in healthcare or you have uh, private data that you send a bank or you um, are sending your social security number, that's all examples of uh, person, personally identifiable information. And there's different controls that you need to have on top of that. And you need to make sure you have a very robust way to detect that you have those uh, that data in your environment and then you can classify it and do the right thing about it. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the last thing I'll touch on is the preparation of that data is uh, going back to the data architecture. I can't tell you many times or very early in my career, I just started creating a table or I just started creating um, a data model as I coded. Absolute wrong way to do that is at 
always, if you can create a data model, you can use pro, uh, tools like Magic Draw, you create a UML diagram. Um, you want to make sure you version that um, in case you change a data attribute and you want to go back to a way that was, has been anything in software, you know, how it looked three weeks ago, a month ago, you want to make sure you ver want to version it. And then you want to make sure you have a good staging zone where you can prep clean and get that data ready so that you can publish it into the um, into the repository. So, you know, with that said, is uh, I wanted to kind of give everyone just a, a, a talk about uh, some of the challenges, war stories, and um, ways that uh, I've learned and how I'm thinking about this uh, going forward. No, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chris, for sharing there. Um, I mean, especially even what you said there for me resonated. I mean, I'm a, I'm a data scientist at a major healthcare um, uh, hospital chain here. And, you know, we were talking about data protections and things like that, HIPAA laws, things like that. And then as well as how we store data, you know, and keeping it in cold storage. You know, if I'm going to take something off the network, it has to go on a special um, USB uh, drive. So a special token actually is what it's called. But um, I think what you said here was very, very important, and very salient to, um, to what I have to deal with as well. So that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and try to keep it moving here. And if anybody wants to reach out to me again, I dropped my email, my cell phone, and then also uh, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, you can. Um, and I'll try to check stuff as soon as I can, like I say, throughout the day and, and whatever. And I've also updated Canvas. So uh, that being said, let's go ahead and move on to who's next. And thanks again, Chris. We greatly appreciate it. So uh, Kristen, fire away here. All right. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Nope. Confirm it, confirm it. Yes. Yeah, we're confirming. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that my example, after seeing some of the earlier ones, um, seems very simplistic, but I think it's important to realize that all companies are in a different place along their um, competitive uh, or competing in analytics sort of framework. Uh, and our company is is pretty in the pretty early stages. Our entire data organization, unlike Todd, who has 10 or 20 or 300 data scientists, um, our entire data organization is me and one analyst who's just out of college who works for me. Um, so that's it. So this example might seem a little bit simplistic, but it is a way that um, we can make life easier. Um, I don't know why it's not forwarding. Hmm. There we go. Um, so I'm going to give an example of a market basket analysis. Um, that I completed in R. So market basket analysis completes some association rules and makes some calculations to tell you how frequently people buy things together, whether that be in a retail environment or in an e-commerce environment. So there's a relatively famous example uh, regarding um, that it was proven that people purchased beer along with diapers. Uh, I think it was at mini marts. Uh, I think it's since been disproven, um, but that's sort of the, your classic market basket analysis. Um, I also live in Wisconsin, so we probably buy beer with everything. So I don't know that it's necessarily false, um, but there are a couple of packages in R that, that use an a priori algorithm. Uh, there's an A rules package and an A rules viz package uh, that makes calculating market basket analysis metrics much easier. So uh, I work for an outdoor recreation manufacturer. Uh, one of our brands is Scuba Pro, which is obviously scuba, scuba diving um, equipment. And we are in the process of replatforming all of our uh, e-commerce sites. And one of the questions that came up was how often people were using our product comparison tool, how many products they were comparing on average, and what were those products? Um, so we were going through some of the UX design for our new website and found that uh, we can currently compare four products at once, uh, but that is not an optimal experience on a mobile device. Um, so we were hoping to be able to reduce that to maybe three products. So what I needed to know was on the Scuba Pro website, how many items are compared on average, which items are most commonly compared. And then I also wanted to find out what, which two-way comparisons are most common. Uh, if we found that consumers were often comparing two different items that they couldn't discern the difference between, um, that can give us some content marketing ideas around perhaps a blog post, perhaps it's um, a video on our YouTube channel that would explain the difference between products A and B uh, for those consumers that are looking for that type of information. 
So the first pass, I went at it really rudimentary. This was one of those situations like, hey, could you get us an answer by like tomorrow? Um, so I went into Google Analytics and this data is an event in Google Analytics that we have identified um, that's pipe delimited. So I was able to download thousands of rows of data that showed me all of the various comparisons and account for them within the last fiscal year. Um, and downloaded that to a CSV, then I converted some text to columns, and then I had to rack my brain to go back to 410 or 401 whenever we talked about combinations to see how many ways the same two items could be compared if you were choosing two from a set of four. Uh, and the answer there is 12. Um, I set up a matrix of the 450 items on our website by 450 items on our website to come up with the most common two-way combos and then copied this big, long, incredibly ugly Excel um, equation into all 202,000 cells in order to come up with the answer. But I did come up with the answer and the answer is they compare on average 2.6 um, products on the Scuba Pro website. I also calculated the same thing for our other eight brands. Um, and these were the top 10 most compared products and the top five most compared combinations. You can also see there on the screen. But I knew there had to be an easier way than this incredibly lengthy, cumbersome, and ugly way to get to that answer. So um, I found a couple articles on these various packages in R. Uh, and there's a code snippet up there of what you have to right to come up with the top 10. It was a little bit more comprehensive than that, but that's basically the bulk of it is that upper left-hand corner box. Uh, and you can see here that on the right, the upper right, that the same items came up as most frequently um, compared. So the uh, MK25 EVO 620Ti uh, dive regulator was our most compared product in both methods that I used to come up with that. Uh, and then the same thing here um, in the left center column is the code for the uh, combinations. And you can see that those top two two-way combinations came up exactly the same at 498 and 495. Um, so a couple tips. Um, R did not like special characters in my item descriptions. So we had a lot of item descriptions that were things like, you know, wetsuit XYZ comma men. Um, so when I delimited the data, it thought that men was a separate item. Um, and we found a lot of counts of comparing men and women um, when really that was part of the item description. So I had to clean all of that up. It also didn't like um, trademarks and registered trademark characters within an item description. So I have linked to the two couple of articles I found here on data science and data camp that went into great detail on the two packages in R that do a really nice job of market basket analysis. Uh, and then we're applying this in some other ways. So one of the ways we applied it over the holidays was for our Jetboil brand um, to determine what sorts of items were often, you know, uh, purchased together to come up with some promotional bundles. Um, and I'm also in the process of going through this for all eight brands right now because we're adding a carousel to our cart that says, you know, people commonly also buy X, Y, and Z. So um, uh, eventually we'll have more of an automated collaborative filtering, filtering type of structure that will power that. But in this interim where we're moving from one e-commerce platform to the next, um, we're going to have to um, do something on our own. Uh, and then there's an example here that I just included of the three main um, measurements that are calculated um, with an example from one of those articles. So there were 100 customers, 10 bought milk, eight bought butter, six bought both. Uh, and then you can see that um, the support is really uh, a measure of the probability of a consumer buying those two items together. Confidence is 75% um, of the time, essentially, people who bought butter also bought milk. And finally, the lift uh, indicates that if a consumer purchased butter, they were 7.5 times more likely uh, to purchase milk than if they purchased it on their own. Um, so there's various ways in which this can be used to um, give you product recommendations or uh, just understand more about your consumer behavior, essentially. So that is it. Hey, Kristen, what were the two R packages you mentioned? Um, they are called, let's see, uh, A rules 
lowercase a rules and a rules viz. I'll, I can put them in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll put a link to those two articles because it gives a really nice description of uh, how to utilize the package and the math behind the calculations. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Appreciate you sharing that. Um, very insightful there as well. Um, again, trying to catch up on time here a little bit. Um, for those that are still remaining and yet to present, if you just kind of present at a very high level, um, what you want to go over and uh, try to keep it to five minutes max. Um, I'm not sure if we have much time for any more questions. Uh, just like I say, because we have a significant amount more to go. So that being said, Stephen, um, go ahead and take it away here. Um, well, one of the big issues that I think everyone's focused on right now is uh, inflation going through our economy. And I provided a presentation to an industry group focused on economic analysis back in October. And I was going to use part of that as uh, part of the uh, part of my uh, commentary tonight. And what I'm thinking about is that the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, does not differentiate between the two types of inflation, the first one being demand pull, the other one being cost push. Demand pull, obviously, is through uh, business and consumer demand for various products and services, and cost push is dealing with more of the supply side. And what I'm using in this particular presentation, using the uh, results that they did, the various activities of, of monetary policy back in the mid 2000s, I think was a trigger for the great, uh, great recession we had during that time, because they did not differentiate between cost push and demand pull. And uh, so I'll go to this next screen here. Or, let me see here. Um, hold on. Let's see, is it freezing up? Well, sorry, it's not moving. <laughs> um, can you see that better? We're still on the first screen, I think. Yeah. Okay. It's just showing. I think it's stuck there. I don't know if there's a way you can just share your entire desktop, maybe. And then just take Yeah. You want me to share it uh, to everyone instead of in, in throughout the presentation or, or afterwards? Uh, either or is fine, Stephen, if you can't. Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, what, what I'm trying to say is that what they were doing is but most of the uh, concerns were during this period of time during the mid 2000s were associated mainly with Hurricanes uh, Katrina and Rita um, that caused a big supply disruption in the oil and gas production areas. So that caused a lot of energy price inflation. The Fed typically makes a comment that they don't move unless they focus on core inflation. Core being ex ex excludes the food and energy prices because that tends to be more volatile. And so they wanted to have a little bit more consistency going forward. However, I noticed in various uh, minutes of the Federal Reserve that they did move on with rate increases, although other core prices are relatively stable, but they do mention that they move because of energy prices. And they did this over a, a series, I believe it was 17 times for 25 basis points over this period and over a fairly short period. And that triggered, uh, I think, a downturn in the overall economy. My opinion is they should have kept it, the, the, the rates flat because what you're wanting to do this was a supply shock. Because it's a supply shock, you want to increase the supply. You don't increase the cost of providing that supply. You want to keep those rates low so they can make investments, bring the supply on, that brings the prices down. The big argument now right between what the Fed's doing or plan on doing is I think they're making a big mistake because the majority of the inflation is driven by these supply shocks. It's not just energy, but other uh, goods and services as well. And most of the demand, pu uh, demand pull inflation is, is transitory in the sense that it's mainly from these government expenditures, from the 
the checks that they provided people to go out there during the, the downturn with the, uh, the COVID response, that's going to end. So that part of the inflation is going to come down. And what they need to do is make sure that they don't continue to do this going forward, but continue to increase the supply. So when the supply increases, the prices come down as well. So yes, they should probably raise up rates, but not before they uh, stop providing this fiscal stimulus with the mortgage bond purchases and uh, the, the payments to the individuals out there. Anyone have any questions? I wish I had my, my screen up. Uh, no, thank you, Stephen. I think you, uh, you gave us some stuff to think about there. I mean, maybe- There we go. Is it working? <laughs> maybe when you start changing there up our go. portfolios here before it's too late, I mean. <laughs> right. Here's, here's some of the comments here. One of the things is oil and gas is, is relatively priced and elastic over this short period. So even the rate increases, it wasn't going to make a difference anyway. So what they did is they, they countered the input price, the energy with another input price, which was the capital price, which you're basically, you're having this negative feedback loop. And here's some of the minutes that was, uh, I was able to get from the uh, uh, federal uh, Fed funds minutes the Federal Open Market Committee talking about that the core was, was moderate, but they increased it because of the energy prices. This goes to show you, here's the core inflationary measures, which is relatively flat. Here's energy price inflation, the purple. And here's the Fed rate moving the various periods that the change over the time. You see this tightening period. This is where the hurricanes happened and where the EPA mandate came into place with the ethanol. So that increased the cost. They kept jacking up these rates. And then of course, the great recession happened. What I believe is, is what they should do is, uh, the, the analogy I use is they should have uh, fed a cold because there's this congestion in the overall economy. You wanna free up that congestion versus the starving of the fever, which is whenever you have the demand demand pull. Any questions? Okay, Doke, thank you. I appreciate that again, Stephen. Um, right, thank you. Sorry about the ahead. slide problem. <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, if you could share those slides with uh, me and Dr. Wedding, um, we can go yeah. ahead. Um, I guess anybody that's interested in seeing this, Steve, if you don't mind sharing it, um, we can send it to whoever was in this presentation if they'd like to see it because it didn't get to show. So sure. you're good with that. Okie doke. I appreciate that. Uh, Nicholas, are you prepared and ready to go here, sir? I am. Okie doke. The floor is yours. Awesome. So um, I'm going to review a system for forecasting at R. Uh, so just to set some context, I was new to a data science team having done you know, traditional analysis and BI, and this was to be my first uh, project where I was actually going to predict something. And my boss threw forecasting at me, which no one had any experience uh, on my team doing. So I was at the front. So I was a little intimidated going back to what Todd said, my typical approach to something new would be I'd read a bunch of books and come back six months later and try to do something. <laughs> but that clearly wasn't going to work. Um, and so I took a different approach. I, I was lucky in that our studio conf was going on and it was online. So I, I just put it out there in the chat. Hey, has anyone done any forecasting? And fortunately someone came back and said, Hey, you should check out this model time ecosystem, um, which is a system for producing forecasts. My boss was actually pushing one particular tool uh, which is Profit, which is a, a system built by Facebook. It's a black box forecasting system. It's really easy to use, but I wasn't seeing good accuracy. So I'm going to walk through it uh, very quickly, and then I'll share a link. So if anyone is curious, they could just Google model time, and there's a walkthrough on it. And so what this will do is this is looking at uh, daily email users, how many subscribe, uh, on a given day and trying to predict uh, subscriptions over an eight week period. So just to look, show you guys the data, basically we have an opt-in. It's a opt-in at a particular time and for each person. Uh, and so one of the things this system does really easy is if we look at this data, 
um, it produces a, a summary diagnostic. So you can see when the when the when the your data set starts, when it ends, what the scale is, um, and then one of the things guys you could look at really quickly is what's the the gap between samples, and you can see like the median is 80, 86,400, but the max is much larger. So it, tell, it tells you you have gaps. And so there's a, a function in there to take care of those gaps. And so I just did that. And what we can do is then look at those summary diagnostics again and see that you have the same gap between everything. So that's cool. And then you could um, forecast your, you could look at your data set, just take an, an eyeball look and see Okay, this looks relatively normal, but there's this big nasty spike here. That's an anomaly. So I don't want to include that when I build my model. Uh, so I'll filter the data and then look at it again. And it looks much more um, like stable. Okay, so in, like with any modeling, you have training and test sets. It makes it really easy to do, to split, to split that and then shows you um, here's your training data in dark blue and your test data is in red and you can examine that interactively. Um, that's useful. Um, and so here my boss wanted me to use profit. So this is modeling uh, using profit. You could see it's like four lines of code. Um, and then you, you, you actually go through and you create a model table, you train it, that's right here. And then here you can quickly see what the forecasted values are. You can see it's, you can zoom in. Red line is forecasted value. Blue is actual. It's pretty far off. It's not performing very well. If I, you know, you could look at the stats. You see RMSE, the average percentage error, not very good. Um, so then it makes it easy to examine potential other features. So let's say you know time series. There's a lot of seasonality typically. So this shows you how um, things differ by day of week. So if you wanted to add day features does the same thing for other date features like month and quarter. And that's an exploratory analysis. Um, what this does is this is adding um, those some date features to my data set. So now instead of just opt-in time, I have half year values that are uh, normalized. That's done there very easily. And what I really wanna show, so I'm just gonna skip ahead. Here I'm doing a different model. I'm just doing a, a simple linear model uh, based on um, those date those date features that I added. And you can see this simple linear model performs slightly better than um, than the profit. And what I what I want to show here is. What I really liked about this tool, being someone who was new to forecast, I didn't just check uh, two different models. I, I did a bunch of different ones, but you could very easily, and you know, less than a couple hundred lines of code. And if I didn't do DDA even shorter, you could see how models perform against, uh, against themselves, uh, which is really good. Uh, again, for someone who had no forecasting experience, just being able to test a bunch of different models. Uh, if you look, he has a quick start guide and in that quick start guide, they show like four different models and you can see that very easily. I mean, in my, in my forecast, I ended up testing, I don't know, a hundred variations with different features um, and different model types very easily. And it made uh, what was initially a very intimidating process. It, was, it turned out very fun. And I was able to replace a forecast process that took a bunch of senior leadership hours of meetings every quarter and replace it with just my time. I get these things updated in like a couple business days very easily. Um, so I would, I would recommend everyone looking into this model time if anyone's doing forecasting. That's it, any questions? That. Yeah, I appreciate that, Nick. That's uh, something that's very interesting there. I mean, I know you brought up the profit model thing. That's gotten a lot of notoriety recently. Um, anybody wants anything interesting to read into, read what happened to Zillow. Um, but again, I think that they used it improperly and probably didn't take the right. Um, oh, were they using profit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, I don't know, yeah. I haven't had much success with profit. I mean, I have my forecast, I'm forecasting technical support case volume by different geographical regions and by product combinations and tiers of support. Um, so I do like, I think like 40 different forecasts every quarter. The profit did not perform, it didn't 
I didn't end up using it for anything. Maybe one or two forecasts, like one quarter when I used it. But it is really easy to, to get started with and try. And it probably performs a lot better for, um, you know, daily data. I'm looking at quarterly data. Right. No, and like I said, I mean, I think you got to be able to fine tune a little bit. I mean, I messed around there a little bit with my prior job um, in supply chain. I won't drag on too long about this. Uh, to predict out revenue per shipment over time and things like that. Um, but that being said, I mean, I think that's the problem with these packages that come out. I mean, they're very simple. Uh, there's yep. very few arguments to enter. And so anybody thinks they can be a data scientist <laughs> without yep. the proper training. And I think that's kind of the uh, trouble you run into without having the sound statistical background and, uh, you know, machine learning understandings uh, that really are critical to being able to do this at a, at a high level. So Yep. That's just my two cents. Um, that being said, uh, Nicholas, if you want to add anything else, feel free to. Um, if not, um, Sally, you're up next here. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I think Nicholas, yeah. Okay. I was looking for that button. Okay. <laughs> <Found it. laughs> All right. All good. Okay. See. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. So I'm shifting gears a little bit here. I'm just going to show you um, um, a Python code optimization um, skill that I learned or a package that I learned um, doing my job. So what I do in my job, basically, I'm not in the modeling space yet. Uh, what I do is help actually the modelers in our team build, uh, make the processes that they have more efficient or faster. So basically code optimization. And I learned about Numba and basically what it does, I, there's like a, this is from their website, uh, but I really like what they have here. It just Numba makes Python code fast. Um, so basically the problem that we had, we had um, 200 data frames that we needed to do some calculations on. And we had different parameters. So we ended up with like running some calculations on thousands of data frames. And you can imagine how long that takes, uh, even though we had like the code was written in a very efficient way. So we needed to look for something that even does it faster, more in a more like efficient way. So we, I used Numba. Um, and basically what it does, <clears throat> um, you just like write your function. And this is, um, I just took snippets from a YouTube video that talked about Numba. So basically all you do, you write a function in Python language and what it does in the background, um, um, it, it, you can use JET, which is a compiler. So it changes this like Python language to um, a machine language, like a, a binary language. So it runs faster. So if you can see here, this is the just a regular function without any like, JET or any like the just in time compiler yet. So it takes about 7.41. And then um, and then if you use the JET compiler before the function, uh, then you can see how much that reduces the time. So I think it becomes very handy when you're dealing with a lot of data. Um, and you're trying to, instead of having some code run like for two days, you can just like tremendously decrease the, uh, the runtime. Um, so the only thing is that the first time you call your function actually using JIT, you'll probably see a spike in the time. It's not gonna decrease. It's actually gonna increase because in the background, the compiler is changing, like it's, it's doing the magic of changing this Python language. Um, so to make it faster, but after that, every time you run it, it's uh, it's gonna take way less time. Um, yeah, and I have some resources, basically the Numba website and this YouTube video, I, I watch a lot of videos and this one really just um, very concise and pretty much covers everything and covers the mistakes that people do when they use Numba. And because sometimes when I first used it, like most of the time, I, the time, the runtime was not really going down that much. And he covers pretty much all of the errors that I did uh, when I first used it. So yeah, that's all I have to share.
Okay, thank you, Salma. Um, if you want to go ahead and by chance, if you can copy and paste, you know, your slide there into the chat, that'll make it easier for folks to go ahead and check those out, those links there. So um, yeah. that being said, I've never heard of Numba, but definitely something else to look into um, in terms of the machine learning ecosystem. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, um, next person here, let's move on to Jody. Uh, Jody, are you ready to go? Sure, I'm doing something very different than when everybody did. Um, I am, uh, I took your, your uh, feedback to heart earlier when you said that uh, we should all be trying to do an app, a, a mobile app, and I had never done one before. So I wanted to take the opportunity to learn. Um, and I found some very cool stuff that I thought would be useful for people uh, if they wanted to create an app. So originally when I started looking, I got a bit lost. Um, am I gonna use native uh, capabilities? Am I gonna try and use some interpreters? Um, and I came across the React Native JS framework uh, with Expo plugin that allows you to actually uh, put your package together in a way that will be able to run on both Android and, and iOS, uh, as well as tablets and, uh, and PC browsers uh, with very simple manipulations. I'm just gonna show you a little bit about what that looks like. And, it, and, it's, and it's very quick and it's almost immediate. So um, here I can just show you, I'm showing my laptop screen, which is relatively small, but I think you'll be able to get the gist. So right here, I just have some of my code if I just do a, a simple change, I can, I can um, see that right away and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is this program folder structure comes when you create your init expo project. So you don't have to create most of these files. It creates them all for you. It creates the structure for you. Um, and what you do is you have something called Metro, which is uh, this window right here. I don't know if you can see very well. But this is the thing that I love the best. So what this allows you to do with this QR code in the bottom here is you can scan this. And when I publish this app, even though I'm not going through the app store or anything else, you can get it on your, on your phone or on your computer directly. And so you don't have to, have to worry about going through all of the processes of publishing your app into the app store right away. You can play around with it. You can test it. Um, you can share apps with friends. There's no limitations. Um, it, it's just a really quick and easy way to not only use emulators, but, but also get it to people. And so what I'm looking to do is have all of the people in my team be able to test the app and hopefully be able to give it out to you guys to test it once we're all uh, completed. So doing it in, in here is relatively simple. You can see that we have emulators set up. I have two here. I have my iPhone and the Android emulator. I don't actually know anybody with an Android phone to do a test on, a real phone. Um, so looking for a volunteer at some point to help me do that in a, in a physical test. Um, but you get the error messages within here. Uh, you can help to do your troubleshooting. And when you are making changes, so I'll just make a, a very simple change. Here is my Android emulator. Here's my iPhone emulator. You get to choose which version of the iOS, which kind of phone, which uh, scale. Um, this is the menu. Um, the developer menu. Uh, so here, there's a lot of things that you can do with the, with the layout to make it simple uh, and usable to read. Um, I can just make a very, I'm just gonna make a mistake so you see it really quickly. Not the way to code, but it's gonna, it's gonna work fast for the story. There you see it, it reacts right away. So, and my phone as well. So all I had to do is make a change. I just hit save um, and it automatically sends it to all of the different devices that are connected through Expo. Uh, it really makes uh, writing the app and um, understanding how it's gonna visualize in the different contexts uh, and troubleshooting super easy. So that's, that's it. No, thank you there, Jody. I appreciate you sharing that for us here. Um, that's very, very technical there. Um, you obviously have a lot of experience there. Uh, doing stuff with uh, React JS and Node JS and everything there, so that's uh, very interesting for sure. 
actually, it was my first time. I had never programmed in JavaScript, never used React.js, never used React Native, never used Expo. So it was my first time doing all of that. Oh my gosh. I mean, you are picking that up like <laughs> unbelievable there. <laughs> that, that, was, that was really incredible there. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, um, Andrew, are you ready to go here, sir? Yeah, definitely. Okay, that's yours. Cool. Um, can everybody see this slideshow? Yep. Awesome. Cool. So kind of like Jody, um, I kind of wanted to try something new, right? Um, I never done web scraping before. Um, so I thought I'd, you know, watch a couple of videos, read a couple of articles, um, and see if I could, see if I could do it, right? Um, so I thought this would be really good experience um, just in kind of finding a, a different way to analyze structure of web pages, the structure of websites, um, and then pulling data from them, right? It would be good experience connecting, you know, creating a database, um, connecting to it, and then, you know, inserting, putting data into that database. Um, and then, you know, using pandas um, data frames to analyze the data that I've collected um, and potentially deal with, with large data sets. Um, because certainly you can get a lot of information when it comes to web scraping. Um, so I worked from like a wiki style page. Um, and the sort of advantage there is consistency. Um, sites store data in roughly the same way for every single page. Um, so at least what I found is that I could scrape them pretty efficiently. Like URL here is like examplewiki.com slash X. And you can change X to get to multiple different pages. Um, and each page kind of has data in the exact same way. So there's consistent elements um, being named. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a bit here. Um, but the, the script that I ended up building here after um, watching a couple of videos, looking at a couple of articles sort of started with uh, a first page, like the, the home page of, of this cookie that I was using. Um, and then sort of how the structure of this works, right, is from that home page, I found all the, the A tags, all the links, um, and then the sort of reference attributes here, I would pull those out into a list in Python. Then I'd use those values as pages, right? If you go back to, to sort of how it's, how it's laid out, um, you know, this, this X here basically changes to each one of those values in the list. Um, so I go through each page, scrape all the links, add those to a list, and then this kind of runs recursively where it's building this huge list just of, uh, just of pages um, in this first step of the script that I can, I can, then, um, I can then analyze. Um, so then in the second step, after I have this very large list, it ended up being like 15,000, 16,000 uh, basically, you know, um, reference attributes or, or pages uh, that I had. Um, I then went through one, it was, you know, one by one, I looked at um, different HTML classes on the page. Uh, you're able to just look at the HTML right on a, on a web page. So I found like one that was class page title that gave me the title of the page. Um, I also looked at categories that, um, that the pages had and just length of the page. Um, and then it was string manipulation to break down the HTML. Um, into names, categories, length of page. Like here's here's sort of an example where you'd get um, the header here coming in, the class's page title. And then I just really want what's in the middle here, this title. So it's just string manipulation to, to, um, to find what's between these two uh, greater than, lesser than brackets, you know, um, to get that string. Um, and then once that's done, you know, insert into the database. Um, and then I was taking a look at this data um, in pandas. So this, Took a couple iterations to get up and running. Um, sort of the, the base of it here, the focus is I'm using a package known as Beautiful Soup. Um, and what's really great about that is it, it takes the HTML content of the web page and just like turns it into essentially an object in Python that you can search through, right? So, you know, for looking down here after my comment here, you know, I'm finding, you know, all these headers with a class page title, that's getting me the title. And then I'm doing string manipulation here, just splitting it between, um, you know, between those brackets there to, to get what I want um, out of it. And I'm doing that here with categories, I'm doing that with length, um, and then I'm pushing those into a database that I've built. Um, but 
but really this is this is as easy as it as it turned out to be when it comes to scraping those web pages um but i let the script that i ended up developing run overnight to process those fifteen thousand uh pages i ended up out of that getting like three thousand pages that actually had data uh the rest of them were uh weren't very good um so i think there's some improvements i have to make there but um this was me kind of getting started with with web scraping um so definitely reach out if folks want like the script i'm happy to share that if you guys want to get started and and take a look at it but um does anybody have any questions okay yeah, thank you andrew i think that's something else that you know folks can you know look into as well as web scraping for some side projects or yeah anything else they want to do. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Um, okay, Alex, you are up next. All righty. Let me know when you can see my screen. We can, can see, see the background. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Alex Bertoy. I'm a current student in MSDS 401. I'm actually pretty new to R, so I actually wanted to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the tidyverse. So what is the Tidyverse? So the Tidyverse is an opinionated collection of R packages designed for data science. All packages share an underlying design philosophy, grammar, as well as data structures. It was introduced by Hadley Wickham, a statistician from New Zealand and chief scientist at R Studio and his team. And all the packages themselves provide an efficient, fast, and well-documented workflow for general data modeling, wrangling, as well as visualization tasks. So what do these core packages consist of? So the core tidyverse includes the packages that you're likely to use in everyday data analysis. So as of tidyverse 1.3, the following eight packages are included in the core tidyverse. The first being ggplot2, which we've seen quite a bit in the course so far. So ggplot2 is a system of creating graphics based on the grammar graphics themselves. So you provide the data, tell ggplot2 how to map variables to aesthetics, as well as what graphical parameters you really want to use. And then it takes care of all the details in terms of the plotting and visualization associated. Dplyr provides a grammar of data manipulation, providing a consistent set of verbs that solve the most common data manipulation challenges. So if you're looking to manipulate data in that regard, you can use dplyr to do so. Taking a look into tidy R, tidy R provides a set of functions that help you get to really tidy data. So tidy is that which is in a consistent form. In brief, every variable goes into a column and every column itself is a variable as well. And then you have read R, which provides a fast and very friendly way to read rectangular data, such as a CSV, TSV, and F3 format in so it's designed to very flexibly parse out many types of data found in the wild while still really cleanly failing when data unexpectedly changes. Then you have PER, and this enhances R's functional programming toolkit. It provides a complete and consistent set of tools for working with functions as vectors, and vectors rather. So once you master that basic, this basic concept, Per allows you to replace many for loops with code that is easier to write and is more expressive. Then you have Tibble, which is a modern reimagining of the data frame itself, keeping what time has proven to be really effective and throwing out what hasn't. So Tibbles are our data frames that are lazy and certainly they do less and complain, more forcing you to confront problems earlier typically leading to cleaner, much more expressive code. And string R provides a cohesive set of functions designed to make working with strings as easy as possible. It's built on top of string I, which uses the C library to provide fast, correct implementations of common string manipulations. And last one in the core package is for cats. So this provides a suite of useful tools that solve common problems with factors R uses factors naturally to handle categorical variables, variables that have a fixed and known set of possible values as well. So then we go into the four basic principles of really optimizing the tidyverse in this core set of packages. And that first one is reusing existing data structures. So where possible, 
it's ideal to reuse existing data structures rather than creating custom data structures for your own package. So generally, it's better to prefer common existing data structures over custom ones, even if they're slightly ill-fitting. The second is compose simple functions with the pipe. So a really powerful strategy that I read about for solving complex problems is to combine many simple pieces. Each piece should be really understood in isolation and have a standard way to combine with other pieces themselves. The third is embrace functional programming. So as we know, R is a functional programming language and the manifesto itself states to embrace it as opposed to fighting it. So if you're familiar with an object programming oriented language such as Python, uh, this may take a little bit of adjustment, but in the long run, you'll be better off working with language rather than finding itself. And lastly, design for humans. So design so that's really easy to use by humans as computer efficiency is a secondary concern because the bottleneck in most data analysis is thinking time, not necessarily computing it. Um, and if you'd like to do additional research or go deeper into the tidyverse, there's some really great resources out there. This is just a few of the resources I looked into when going in and diving in myself, and I can put these into the chat. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, appreciate you sharing that. Like I said, if you can share your presentation in the chat. And also, like I say to anybody else here, uh, if you can go ahead and share your presentations with me and Don, um, we'll go ahead and make sure that we give you credits on the basis of that as well. So um, again, everyone's presenting today or here um, and shared something, we'll get points. So thank you very much. Uh, continuing on here, um, we're gonna move to Robert. Uh, Robert, are you ready to present? I am. Okay. All right, I'll try and go through this quickly. Uh, so first off, uh, just two things. Number one, today is a very important date for most, if not all of us, because as of today, we can finally say next month we're graduating. So that's a huge thing. At least I've been looking forward to being able to say that. Number two, Logan, this thing is amazing, the show and tells. Um, feedback, uh, I think they should be happening in every class. <clears throat> like I've, there's so many cool people that you meet going through this program. Okay, so I um, put together a tutorial uh, on our data frame. So um, I've been writing programs for a long time. I've been a software uh, developer for my whole career. And one of the ways that I teach myself how to write code and how to be a software developer is I write my own tutorials for myself. And occasionally I get to share them. So this is one that I wrote for myself. I put these notes together. Um, I, I emailed this, uh, Logan, I emailed the uh, markdown file to you and the HTML page. Um, I'll just kind of go over the sections of it. Uh, I put all the resources in there as far as where I'm getting the information, but what is in our data frame? So we've all been working with them through this course. It's essentially like an Excel spreadsheet. It's an R object uh, Excel spreadsheet. One thing that I had to kind of wrap my head around, you know, when I was playing with these things is this fact that everything needs to essentially be of equal length. And when I started out creating data frames initially and adding vectors to them that weren't of equal length, I would get, run into a lot of trouble. So finally, I just said, you know, wrote that down. I'm like, yep, got to remember that. All right. So most of the data frames we created um, based on the, the previous uh, presentation was using all that tidyverse stuff like reading um, CSV files or access Excel files into into whoa my whole computer is blown up here uh, into uh, data frames. So what I wanted to do was like use a pure one. So I created four vectors. And I'm using it using that combine function that R provides. And what I would recommend is go through the markdown file step by step and run it. Because as you do, you'll see the structure of the data frame change. 
as you're using, and the, the way I wrote the tutorial, using different methods for creating vectors. But essentially, I created a vector of student IDs, first names, last names, and emails. And then what I did was I used the data.frame, kind of like a constructor, I guess, um, to, 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 to actually create the data frame. I just made one up. I called it, this is a uh, an old programming habit where I always try to put the data type. R doesn't type the, you know, our data types are dynamic. That was another thing that frustrated me with R. It's really funny because when I, oh, I am not sharing. Would it, uh, let me get that shared. All right, are folks seeing now? Thank you for saying. Yep, thank you, Robert. Okay, yeah. So again, um, really quick, the tutorial, uh, some general thoughts, and a bunch of links. Um, here I created the vectors, okay? And then I used um, this, as I was saying, like kind of constructor to create the data frame. And, and just a habit I have when I code is, this is just from doing it for however long I've been doing this, I always try to data type things. And one of the things that, um, it's it's funny because when I when I first learned you know Java and C sharp it was strongly typed you know you couldn't mix and match data types that would frustrate me then I get into R and R is changing data types all over the place and you're getting all of these you know exceptions because you're trying to call functions on 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 the wrong data type and then that frustrates me so you can never win but um, so I just try as best as I can to prefix with the data type. I just made this up. I called it math, math 101 roster, you know, like a class roster. So I have a student ID, which is using my V underscore student ID vector, uh, first name, last name, using all the vectors. One thing I added here was a parameter called string as factors. And I set that as to false because what our what this data dot frame function will do is it will look at strings and create them as a, a vector data type. And I'll get a little bit more into that as we go on. So I basically called the structure method on it. And we can see we have three observations and four variables or columns. And the student ID is a number. And that again is because these are all numbers. So this is another little bit of a gotcha you have to be aware of in R is that R will do what's called coercion, which means it will implicitly change data types on you without you really knowing about it, especially with things like vectors, which can only be one data type. So you think you're mixing and matching, but in actuality, you're not. R is coercing your data types usually into character or strings. So generally speaking, and I'll show you an example of that here, I stay away from this C or combine function and I use lists because that will maintain the integrity of the data types. Okay, uh, column names on a uh, data frame will list out the column names nicely. And then there is S apply, and there is a, an entire family of apply methods. I highly recommend. This is a great article from DataCamp. It's on the apply family. I linked it in there for you. And essentially what these apply family functions do is they will do what's called implicit looping. So instead of having to write a for loop here, you can use any one of these apply functions. There's apply, L apply, S apply, depending on what you're passing it to it. And here I'm essentially iterating through this data frame and I'm calling the class function. So I can see student ID is numeric. That's what the class function is doing. First name is character, last name is character, et cetera. Then I printed out the dimension, the dimensions of it three by four. I use the R bind function to add another row. And this is, uh, if we had a little bit more time, but this is what I was talking about with co coercion. So I'm using R bind to add to uh, this data frame. But do you notice that the number here is not in quotes? By using C, this number will be coerced into a string. 
And you don't know that's happening until you want to like do a mathematical calculation on it. And then you find out that it's no longer numerical. It's now a string or a character. So row bind to add rows. Then I added columns using C bind for test scores. Then what I did was I created a new, just right on the fly, I created a new field or a new variable called total score by using the apply function again, which is going to iterate through that. This one takes a parameter of the data frame and apply wants a two dimensional shape object. So here I'm passing to it uh, columns five through nine, which are essentially these columns, these last uh, five, uh, four or five columns. By setting margin to one, I'm going, I'm iterating uh, across by row and I'm calling the sum function. I essentially create another on the fly function or on the fly um, um, variable or feature called average where I'm essentially doing the same thing, but by using the mean. So now I've essentially summed these numbers and taken their means and stored them in the class roster data frame. Then I wrote my own function, just a custom function here, that takes in a score, evaluates the score, and returns a letter grade. Then what I did was I used the column bind function again on my math uh, data frame, creating a new uh, column called final letter grade where I'm essentially iterating through the average that I previously created, calling the function that I just created. So essentially what it's doing is looking at your average, figuring out where you are and putting it, putting a letter grade in there. Then what I did was I added, okay, fresh new students. So this is after I've calculated the sum, calculated the total score, calculated the average, put in a letter grade. Then I'm like, let's put in new people. So I put, in, I put in three new people for the total average and letter grade for each of these, I put zero, zero and an A. Then what I did was I re-ran those. So now for those new folks, I've got the total score and average. And then what I did again was I ran the letter grade. But what I did here was because I already ran the letter grade on the previous students, I did it only for those students with a student ID greater than or equal to 10 or 10, 10. Now here's the rub. Here I used list instead of C because this would not work because had I used C there, this number, the student ID number 10, 10, 10, 11, 10, 12 would have been coerced to a string and you wouldn't be able to use the logical operator to determine whether or not it's greater than or equal. So I, by using list here, instead of C, it maintains the data type. As a matter of fact, it maintains the data type of all these numbers. If you would have used C, these would have all been converted into strings and you couldn't run any of these uh, sum or mean functions on them or in, and you know, get the grade. So, so I uh, went ahead and put in the final grade. I checked my dimension. And now I have this nice table. So here I'm trying to, this, I use the table function on the data frame final letter grade score to you know, see my distribution of letter grades. I wanted to see who has a, a grade of A. So this is just an example of how to you know, kind of query this. Here's an example of how to sort it. Um, so the grade is a vector, the letter grade, I'm sorry, the letter grade is a factor. And here I changed the letter grade from C to W for a withdrawal, because the policy is if you get a C, you have to withdraw, let's say. And here what I show you how to do is how to convert it from a, a, a factor to a character, then make your change and then put it back to a factor. So you get to see how to do that. And now you can see that I have a distribution of A, Bs, and Ws in two. And then finally, anybody with a W, I'm going to just drop. So now I've got that down to zero. 
And um, I re now I just resorted on the last name so you could just kind of see who's left. So this is just me kind of teaching myself how to, to work with data frames and I thought I'd like to share that. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Robert. Absolutely. Uh, I think really is very uh, relevant to everybody in this class, especially the 401 students here as well. So thank you for you know, helping us out there and sharing, you know, your insights, you know, from your expertise here. So my pleasure. I struggled through uh, this in the first, you know, first few courses. And after a while, I just said, let me just document what I've learned. And it's nice to have the ability to share it. So thank you. Yeah, you, you really helped to get back here. So thank you again. Cool. Okay, Michelle, are you ready to go here? The uh, floor is yours. I don't think Michelle was going to present. Oh, okay. I think she said that in the chat. So I think we're up to Ashton. Okay, no problem. We only got a few left here. Um, sorry about that. Okay, um, Ashton, you are up, sir. Hello. Oh, it is the help if I actually put my camera on. Um, so I wait, wait, wait. That's not Ashton Kutcher. Sorry. Oh, okay. You're no, a different it's Ashton. Not. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it is not but that's how i whenever people say like when i go to starbucks like oh what's your name like ashton but not cut your otherwise but how would you know because i'm wearing a mask and it gets kind of funny <laughs> all the same conversation um but anyways so i'm gonna jump straight into it um and i have a little diagram that i want to share um so i work for an e-commerce website um uh specifically mcmaster car supply company if anybody is uh familiar with it we sell industrial supplies to a variety of businesses, primarily business to business. Um, and with that, we also have a lot of data. Um, so a lot of this is pretty common sense, no trade secret uh, issues here, um, but it's just, um, I'll be highlighting the importance of um, what data we, uh, what data we like kind of like uh, keep and also what we do when we don't have data. Um, the primary kind of overview is what we call error handling. Essentially, whenever we don't have the data that we need and how we can predict when those errors are going to happen by writing good code within our programmatic call chain, essentially. Um, so I'll kind of just go through um, what happens from the first second that the customer orders stuff. Um, once a customer orders something, let's say that it's somebody from SpaceX. Um, somebody from SpaceX in Hawthorne, California uh, places an order and first thing we're gonna do is look at customer information. Um, this is going to gather all the different things like do our customers want um, particular suppliers of this stuff? Because while McMaster doesn't produce its own stuff, we do have information on the parts that we sell and who makes the parts that we sell um, and also where we sell them. So, or sorry, where the products are made. So let's say that um, there's like one very, very specific screw um, and SpaceX has a preference of only wanting it to be made in the US. That's part of the customer, customer information that we're going to have. And that comes into play later um, because we have a variety of checks to make sure that we are covering every single customer preference. Um, and then on top of that, we also have um, this thing, this one specific check where we basically see what kind of customer do we have? Is it an actual business? Is it a nonprofit? Is it just an individual person buying something for the little garage shop? Um, that's all different kinds of information that we want to have. That way we can kind of group together the work that has to be done on these different kinds of orders. Um, so let's say that we have uh, missing information. We run a DB2 query, which is essentially IBM's version of a SQL server. Um, very, very similar querying style, uh, except it has some of its own syntax, a little different. Um, than SQL, but basically the same. You wouldn't really notice a difference except for maybe like the coalesce function, maybe. And that's essentially a function that allows you to say, if we have a query and there isn't information there because it's null, we can assign a default value. Anyways, so let's say that we do have, um, we do run a query, we get a not found. We don't have a row of information for this one customer or we're missing several rows of information for this customer that's when we are going to run a bunch of different programs to collect information from this customer. Maybe this requires um, putting the order on hold. Somebody has to reach out to this customer, input data, and then we have another program that puts all of that customer data into our database. Um, 
all of that information as things that we need in order to actually send out the order. Uh, because we want to make sure that first and foremost, our customers are getting what they want, they're getting them how they want it, and they're getting them legally. Um, because there are a lot of different laws that we have to consider, um, especially for a customer like SpaceX, who is out of California, one of the states that has the highest amount of product regulations that I have ever seen, if not the most. Um, so the first, the second thing we're going to do after we have customer information is check shipment location. This is essentially us saying, do we have, um, is this an export or is this a uh, customer? And if so, we have a bunch of stuff that we have to do. Um, and I should have drawn an arrow to like a different like export check. Um, and then also a different arrow going to California check just because we have so many things there. But we're actually gonna get into that later on in the product information section. Um, so once we get the information here, we pass it down to the product information. And this is where we will essentially say, okay, we have a state, we are shipping something to this state or this country. We are going to query our product database and see, do we have any rows of information for laws in these countries or in these states? And if we get a, um, if we get a found on that, then we will send it off um, to somebody else to find replacement parts. So I, I should have actually uh, pointed down here to check product regulations first um, to help guide. So we check all the product regulations and then that's when we have the back and forth of, do we have replacement parts for these? And if not, what can we do to help make sure that the customer is getting what they want and as fast as they can get it? Um, and then beyond that, I mentioned earlier that we have um, customer preferences. So let's say that a, a, a company really only wants something from the US or for example, it's a, US a branch of the US military. They only want things that are produced in the US. So we are going to have rows of data to check to see that we have those preferences. Additionally, let's say that we don't have any information. We wanna have a row for, yes, we, uh, they have a preference on their product, products being made in the US. We also wanna have a row for no. We don't care where our products are made. We just want products and that's it. Either way, we're going to have air handling in here to handle a not found for customer preferences because we wanna make sure that we have all that information on our customers so that we can provide uh, the services that, that our customers need. Um, and then after all of that is done and we handled all the different cases for um, either missing data or data that we need to change, we're gonna commit all that new data. And this is essentially just the process of, okay, we have passed down data from this program to this program, to the check shipment location program, to the check product information program. And then once we pass all of that, because all that's being passed through um, this ancient language called COBOL, which is what we, which is what we actually use um, for a lot of our order processing, that's when we run all of our insert queries into DB2 and that's it. Um, that's kind of just like the general process for how some e-commerce uh, commerce companies work. Um, I would go significantly deeper, but then that would go into some stuff that I haven't signed an NDA for, but probably should have. And yeah, um, if there are any questions, I know that I'm already at five minutes, so I will go ahead and just give a thumbs up and that, that's it. No, thank you, Ashton. I think uh, what you re presented here is very insightful and uh, I'm sure everyone else here is getting pretty tired at this point, but it wasn't your presentation. Yeah. I think it's just that uh, I couldn't keep us I couldn't keep us on track to be done in an hour. Unfortunately, it was twice as long. And I think it's just because we ended up with a lot more folks than we expected this time, which is which is a good thing. Um, it really is. So thank you, Ashton. OK, um, we go ahead. I got two more people down here. Um, I can't remember for sure. Anna, did you have something to present by chance? or Were you here just to, to watch? Okay, we lost Anna um, Bronson. Um, I know you wanted to present something. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Uh, so let me okay, share. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Okay, uh, do you see my screen? I'm using a iPad, so uh, let me know. Yep, yeah, we can see your iPad screen is sharing. And so it's like a PowerPoint here or something. Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
Okay, thank you so much. So uh, since I'm the last one, I'll be really quick. Today, I'm talking about change management and how uh, to influence organizations to embrace data science. And a bit of a background why I'm choosing this topic is I'm relatively new in my career and uh, I have a background in business analytics and I'm working in finance and I'm trying to implement more data-driven processes, data science techniques and uh, analytics to drive decisions uh, within the teams I'm a part of. And what I've noticed is sometimes some teams embrace the change more than others, whereas uh, sometimes uh, it's a bit of a struggle, even though it's the right thing. And uh, upon further researching, I'm seeing this is a fairly common phenomenon. Uh, one example I found is a Kaggle survey of 7,000 plus uh, data scientists who responded saying most of the problems they are, uh, arise for them are the last mile issues, uh, not necessarily technical ones, but lack of support from a financial perspective or from a management perspective, um, not having uh, clear questions to answer and uh, the results not being used, which is what I've experienced and explaining data science to others. And uh, this is a common scenario that I had experienced with a couple of teams I've been a part of. Fortunately, my current team is on the positive side uh, of this, but uh, usually it comes with an employee pitching a powerful new process or model. Uh, the example I did is like predict future sales. Uh, initially, everyone's really uh, excited, but when the solution is actually developed, uh, the change is resisted. And uh, several factors that came uh, to mind was uh, one of them is some, uh, sometimes uh, people get in their comfort zone and want to stick with the status quo, uh, common phrases, well, we've always done it this way, so why should we change? Uh, another area is uh, either the mathematical concepts are too confusing, or uh, more often, it's if you're introducing programming, a lot of the times, at least in a business, uh, on the business side, a lot of people don't have a programming uh, background, so it's confusing for them. And uh, sometimes there's a concern of uh, loss of time or money on a project. Um, so those are three main concerns I've uh, observed and I think is pretty standard when I was doing my research. So what are some strategies that I personally have used and I've seen success? Um, and uh, is first of all is build first and share the final outcome rather than talking about it, actually build the uh, solution and give a demonstration afterwards. Um, educate through uh, sharing, discussing, demoing uh, data science topics. It could be lunch and learns. It can be just sharing an article with your manager or your colleagues just slowly chiseling in data science being used to improve the way we work. Uh, I've noticed that that uh, helps alleviate some of the fear of change. And then starting small, uh, making small projects, small changes rather than big scale projects, uh, get some small wins to build the momentum. And then communicate frequently. If you're working on a project, uh, just bring the manager along. Because generally, with, if you want change, you want to get the main influential figures on your side. So it's really important to communicate with them. And uh, most importantly, what we're practicing today is uh, your presentation and persuasion skills. Um, it, you may have a great idea, but if you can't pitch it, if you can't present it, then really it just falls through the cracks and, and never gains traction. And... Um, uh, last but not least, I really thought this quote resonated by uh, Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest or most intelligent who, who will survive, but those who can best manage change. Um, in the, the world is changing at a rapid rate. And if businesses don't embrace data science, they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And uh, I think that's why our field is very, very important. And teams need to, all teams, even something totally unrelated, should at least try to implement data science into their role. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bronson. Um, did anybody have any questions for him? Go ahead and fire away here. Nothing other than, I think this is really important. I know that's echoing 
my stuff at the beginning here, but there's so much, there's so much in that last mile has nothing to do with technology. And we just, the more you practice a lot of those elements that he put in there, um, you know, just the more successful it'd be. I mean, I can't tell you how many PhDs, you know, like will, will do so such good work and they'll lose out on that translation layer. And in this program in particular, I, I, I think we're, we're really focused on, on useful, useful data science, useful analytics. And, and I only say useful in that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And uh, I think that all of us should really internalize elements of that, um, you know, and make it, make it your driving force for how you value your skill set. You can't value always how, how much technology you know, but valuing how much translation you can do and how much you can connect with your customers is so much more important and, you know, beats, you know, knowing a GAN or deep learning or whatever it is, it will, it will always outpace it. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox because I know everybody's tired. So. No, thank you everyone for hanging with us here. Um, again, it took a little bit longer than I thought to get through it, but I think everybody uh, brought something of value to the table that, you know, it was really rewarding for myself to be able to, you know, at least throw this out there and then have you guys lead it. Um, it really was um, a great learning opportunity, I think, for everybody here. So that being said, um, the off chance, did I miss anybody out there? If I did, please um, go ahead and ping me right now if I forgot you for one reason or another. Um, I want to give you the opportunity here and it doesn't look like we did. Um, again, you know, we're getting towards halfway through the quarter here. Um, we're essentially there. So continue to grind away. If anybody needs any help or has any questions about the homework, feel free to ping me at any time. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, we also got the other course TA that oversees all the classes as well that does the, uh, Todd that does the sessions on the Sundays as well. So he's been doing that for about four or five years now and he's, you know, he enjoys doing that as well. So you can reach out to him or like I say, just feel free to reach out to me for the individual class as well. So um, everyone have a good evening and uh, look forward to, uh, you know, helping Dr. Whiting out with the rest of your papers and the uh, presentations here for 498. So um, have a good evening. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, Logan. Yep. Thank you. Great, thank you.